Hello, I am Aura. And I'm Maddie D. I wrote Rin's Path. And this is my frank and unfiltered review of Rin's Path from the visual novel. Where is my mind? Where? Okay, here's my two minute summary of Rin's Path. Is this it? Nope. I think. Wait. Here we go. Shit. Maybe? Aww. All right, let's see here. Um, huh. God damn it. All right, once more, into the breach. Uh, no, no, I said breach. Oh, maybe I should... No, no, saving you for last. Is this it? Oopsie. Comfort me, Maddie. <laughs> well, if I gotta... Wait, how the hell did I... All right, eighth time's the charm. Yes, finally! Well, that's just stupid. Aw. Damn it! Seriously? Seriously? What the shit? Seriously? What? <laughs> And that was me trying to get onto Rin's path in a nutshell. How would my path fit in a nutshell? It's a metaphor about... never mind. Maddie, what you doing? Oh, hi, Emmy. I'm trying to do Rin. Hey, do you think you can help? Um, yeah, of course I can. Really? Sweet. Emmy, is there anything she can't do? <laughs> well, here you go. Drink this. Rin's path. Wait, for real? Well, it is Emmy, so even if she's leading me astray, it'll still be a good time. Yep. Come on, Maddie. And here she is. Rin, Maddie wants to do ya. People say they're head over heels when they're happy. But isn't that the way we normally are? <laughs> Not me. Yep, I'm on Rin's path. Oh, I think the Rin is starting to kick in. My head feels like a flat line that's swirling. A swirling, flat line. Ow! <laughs> Ow, my brain! Is cereal soup? Ah, Rin! Look out! Something's wrong. It's like my brain wants to tell me something, but it can't. Because it doesn't have a mouth. And that was Rin's Path. Thanks for watching! So with your feet in the air, head on the ground. I tend to share a lot of personal stuff in these videos, as I find experiencing a visual novel and then making a tribute or review video to be very therapeutic. And occasionally, I probably overshare. Occasionally? Shut up, you. And well, here I go again. So you don't know this, but when I'm ready to start a new visual novel, or even a new path, I tend to procrastinate. I'm all ready to start, and then I don't. Not right away. I'm not 100% certain why. A lot of it is probably because it does take a lot of work to make these videos. Which shouldn't be bad, because it's the fun kind of work. But I think the real reason that I dally, get pensive and drag my feet, is different. See, a side effect of my getting hurt was that my brain rewired itself, and I live in a pretty regular state of hyper-alertness, with sudden and uncomfortable peaks as my adrenaline likes to sound red alert, often for no reason. And I'm quite overly sensitive and empathetic to the emotional states of others or situations. So I'm very immersive to emotional events, especially things like, oh, I don't know, a visual novel where I find myself deeply self-inserted into the main character's role? Yup. Yes! Where do thoughts go when they're forgotten? What? Because I really get deep into the role-playing of the part, so when I play one, I really experience it emotionally. It's on a level that feels real. Look, I know it's not real. It feels real. And it dredges up similar emotions from events from my past, making connections that at times can be quite awesome. So if I'm in one of these games and I fuck up, I really experience that fuck up emotionally. And even when I get it all right, there's still a deep emotional toll, followed by a feeling of loss, as even the greatest stories with the greatest characters end. And I'm left alone. Maybe that's why I deep dive these reviews? Maybe being that deeply involved in the universe allows feedback in a manner different to what the casual observer relates. Anyway, I procrastinate. I get very eager to start and then I don't, not right away. So it took several days when I was ready to go do Rin, before I actually got to where I was able to screw up my courage and hit the damn start button. But you did start it. Yes. Yeah. So what's the problem? Well, I've written 7,000 words for this video, but I haven't said anything, really. It's all rambling feels and deep insight. And no semblance of any kind of order. It's like a 7,000 word verbal diarrhea. That does sound about right for a Rin video. Do you think you're still it from a game of tag you once played? Rin's path is a bit of an acid trip. A bit? And a lot of times when we're with her, managing her, and the choices on her path come up, I feel like I'm all thumbs. <laughs> Uh... Oh shit. Uh, what I mean is, she's pretty peculiar and ponderously perplexing, and plenty particularly particular. 
And she's also, well, how do I put this? You know when you make an odd sound and your dog makes that face? If it's zero degrees outside today and it's supposed to be twice as cold tomorrow, how cold is it going to be? That. Rin is a creature of the moment, of whim and impulse. I mean, kinda. Most of the time she's aloof and seemingly emotionally disengaged from everything that's happening around her. Observant, but detached. Like she's watching a rerun of a not very interesting show that she's seen a million times before. But Rin has the ability to be focused. She has the ability to be clever. And I'm going to get into that in a bit. She often seems to lose herself either intentionally or unintentionally, and becomes detached and disassociated, especially when she's drawing or painting. Rin was difficult to get on. Her path, you pervs. At least for me, I kept coming up with Kenji. And once I did get on Rin... Oh. Phrasing. I felt like Hassau for much of the route, in a state of constantly almost connecting with Rin. And yet she's so elusive. Like trying to hold on to a wriggling fish. The tighter you hold it, the more it just slips out of your hands. The only way to really hold it is to cradle it gently. More support it than anything, really, and hope it doesn't wriggle too much. Rin's savant style of interacting with the world had my brain constantly on two trains of thought the whole time. One, she's quite clever. It's impressive the way she's able to twist language and approach conversations from such oblique angles. And, number two, what the fuck is she talking about? Centaurs have two sets of lungs. She is in constant contradiction, an enthralling paradox, an irresistible force hitting an immovable object. What, were you just talking about conjoined twins? What the shit? <laughs> oh, Jesus. Now there's a missed opportunity in this game. Why? Why? Threesome. Right up front, I ended up restarting this route a couple of times because I wasn't connecting. I was told by a lot of people, Rin, best girl, great writing, Delta's best work, and that a route contains the best art in the game. And it is visually awesome. I just wasn't getting into the groove for some reason. And then Rin says she sometimes has trouble finding the right words. I have that. I mean, I've got a pretty rich vocabulary. I like cool words. But often, quite often, I struggle to find the words or phrases that properly capture and encapsulate what I'm experiencing. That poignant, raw feeling that is slippery and hard to explain. And that was my way into Rin. And once I was in, my mind was Rin's playground. And I love that. Really good satire, or funny irony, is great. It seems to engage an underutilized part of the brain for me. Much like Rin's presence makes Hassau start to notice things that most of us don't. This video has spoilers. This video has spoilers and yada yada. So make sure you've played Rin's Root, and then watch the video. Go play Katama Shoujo! <laughs> So, I'm in Act 1, and it's the scene in the art room where we first meet Rin. We didn't think there was going to be anybody in here, and neither did Rin. Now, this is the first time I've paid attention, really paid attention to this conversation, at least since the very first time I played through Katawa Shoujo more than a year ago on Hanako's Path. I've been busy. I do have a life, you know. Mm, no, you don't. Remember, all the playthroughs since then, I've just been burning through whatever scenes didn't involve the character I was pursuing. And I'm really happy I did it that way, because once again, this is all fresh and new and very cool. In Act 1 and in Emmy's path, we find out that Rin and Emmy like to have lunch on the roof together. So at this moment in the story, I already know that Emmy is her normal lunch buddy and that she's currently off horsing around, running track. And Rin is alone for lunch. Shish. Meal. That isn't dinner. Anyway, it's interesting that she chooses to find a place where no one else is around. I wonder if this self-isolation is normal for her, and if it's going to mean something later. Because it's not like she's shy. She immediately drops the joke about not shaking hands. Because she has no arms. Yeah. So she can shake hands. Yeah, yes, we get the joke. Can she shake feet, I guess? Uh, okay, I think you've had enough of this. You're cut off. Aww. So Rin has self-isolated, and then Hassau comes along, and he's new and interesting, until Hassau waffles, as he's prone to do, and Rin quickly loses interest. So when he's interesting, she was interested. Or to put it another way, Rin is interested in things that are interesting to Rin. Thanks, Captain Obvious. Yeah, that sounded more poignant when I wrote it. But then Hassau gets interesting again when they talk about what is the word for a meal between lunch and dinner, prompting Rin to ask Hassau, what's your deal? Why is he at Yamaku? And is there anything wrong with Hassau's junk? <laughs> yeah, she's definitely not shy. But the real takeaway question here is, will we get to become her first occasional visitor? Spoiler. Maybe. Obviously. Where is my mind? 
All right, so I'm gonna jump ahead to what was for me the big choice on the route. Stuff happens before the choice, but it's not as interesting. So I'm gonna do a Rin here and I'm gonna jump right to the interesting stuff. On my first playthrough of Rin's Path, I got to the Rin do the gallery choice and I was pissed. I was taken aback that we're given what feels like a terrible, terrible choice because Rin doesn't wanna do the gallery. It's pretty obvious. So why are we telling her that she should go for it? Since this was a big deal for me and I got all butthurt, let's delve into it a bit. Rin doesn't care that she won't get a chance like this again. She doesn't want to do it, she said so. It is like her to hesitate like this, because unless she's interested in something, she hesitates, or completely ignores things that don't interest her, at least on the outside. She took forever to do the mural, waiting to the last minute because it wasn't very interesting to her. And who cares if she's wasting her talents? They're her talents to waste. Okay, maybe not the healthiest attitude to have. I, I know, but I just didn't want to pick any of these choices. Maybe if I stare at them long enough, they'll change. Nope, these aren't much better. Look, I get it would kind of kill the story at this point if Rin said, Nope, we're not going to do it. And we were all like, You go, girl. No means no Mia. But for me, it didn't feel like we were encouraging her. It felt like we were teaming up on her, bullying her. As the buildup is that she's not ready to make this decision. See, right before this choice, Rin confesses she's terrified. She confides right there. And then we're all like, eh, don't worry about your existential crisis, Rin. Pasha! We discard her concerns and fears. And that's why I got butthurt. The choices given to us feel so sudden and dismissive. It's like, really? Now is when Hasao decides to be decisive? If Hasao had a stronger moment, a more blatant epiphany, and an opinion towards the idea of Rin getting a gallery prior to the choice, then it would have made sense to me that he says this. But Hasao is typical wishy-washy Hasao. It's like he sees... If it was me in Rin's shoes, that would be a great opportunity to stop being a miserable glum bummer who never smiles and makes Hanako seem like a party animal. Something productive in his life. But it's not Hasao in Rin's shoes, it's Rin in Rin's shoes. Obviously. And Rin's overwhelmed, not sure if she's ready, or even if she wants this opportunity at all. But Hasao doesn't see that she doesn't see it as an opportunity, do you see? I, um, I said a lot of stuff like that writing this script. All right, here we go. The first time Nomiya mentions the idea of Rin and her art being featured in a gallery, Rin is taken aback. Clearly not excited about the idea. Hasao is not the sharpest tool in the shed, but still, Rin's reactions are pretty obvious. She's upset by the idea to the extent that we have to follow her all the way out to Worry Tree. In retrospect, sure, Hasao is projecting himself upon Rin's choice and the decision about the exhibition. That in his own way, he's stuck between who he was and who he could be. He's recognizing this and he wants to improve his life, especially after hearing Rin say she hasn't seen him smile. Ever. So let me dovetail here for a minute into the scene that follows Worry Tree. Hasao starts the decision that it's time to turn his life around. Great! He doesn't really help Rin with her deal, less great. And then on the walk back, he waffles and he gets depressed. Not great. And then he gets a letter from a Wanako. Okay, let me deviate from that dovetail, off of that aside, to say that I found it really interesting and cool that when Hasao gets a Wanako's letter in this route, he writes her back. Even though we don't have much indication of what he writes, other than whatever it is, a Wanako probably won't reply, I was so glad that he did it. Has anyone ever considered a Wanako story? She falls in love with this guy, asks him out, and he has a heart attack and nearly dies. And then he goes to a school where he has deep emotional growth, meets, falls in love, and bangs the love of his life five times. Holy crap, that's right. Six, if you count Misha. Enjoy twins. Yeah, uh, anyway. The Iwanako scene felt to me like there was something more that was meant to come out of Hasao writing her. But maybe deadlines and story overruns caused it to be cut? But I would have loved for this to be more of Hasao wrapping his head around his own situation. The letter happens in the story at a point where he's starting to turn the corner on being a miserable no smiling emo to the emotional recovery and reinventing himself in the aftermath of his condition. And I had to dig deep into what he might have written back through the story to help me make the connection to that choice. I mean, Hasao gets really nihilistic on this route. Nothing really matters at the end of the day? The ticking of the watch like the ticking of his heart? Jesus Christ, dude. But being with Rin, he starts noticing things that we normally don't notice around us. Big things, the sky. Small things, like dandelions. Other people. And although Rin is like a mirror that doesn't reflect anything... That's a good line. I know, right? That's a fucking great line. Hasao starts to see himself through her art and through her and his own observations. He really does start to develop his character arc in the scene in Worry Tree. And then near Zenith, in that moment on the roof with a weird hug with Rin. The problem is that the choice is stuck between those two events. So what did he write to Iwanako? 
The story brushes it off a bit, so at first I was happy he did it, but didn't pay it much attention. But I ended up going back to this scene several times, looking for something, a clue, something that explored a bit more of his struggle of fixing himself. Maybe in the letter telling her, You're right, Iwanako. I did give up. I was depressed and angry, and I retreated inside of myself. I hated what was happening to me, and I didn't want to deal with it. I, I didn't know how to. So I packed everything away so I wouldn't have to feel anything. And then I got stuck there, and I lost myself in that nothing. I'm sorry that things turned out the way they did, and that I couldn't appreciate all that you did for me, and all that you were going through too. I'm also sorry that I wasn't able to be your boyfriend. I really wanted that. The short time that we were together in the snow when you asked me, that was a dream come true. But I was never able to tell you the thing I so wanted to say to you. Yes, and thank you. My new school is, well, it's nothing like I expected, but everyone is great, really generous. And I kind of feel like I'm unworthy of all of their kindness, all of their attention. But I think I've gotten to a point where I'm ready to be somebody who is. I think I'm ready to allow myself to be happy again. And then reflecting on seeing where he is and seeing this great opportunity, like the doctor and his parents and the nurse and Muto all told him it is, getting over the grief and mourning the loss of who he was to become who he is and move on towards the who he can be. Then deciding that, yes, the gallery is a great opportunity for Rin. Rin's helped me so much, now I can help her too. She has to do the exhibition. This would have nicely tied into that choice that got me so butthurt and also smoothly flowed into the great scene where we have the choice and then paved the way for Hassan on the roof where he cries for his condition for the first and only time. So, naturally, Hassan wants to change to take charge of his life. Hassan knows who he was. He's not that guy anymore. It's time to figure out who he could become. The problem is that Rin doesn't even know who she is. She shares that with us when she sees Emmy at her Emmyist and the wonderful passion behind it and how great it is for somebody to be themselves. And then when we remark that she of all people is someone we see as being themselves, she confesses that she's not sure who she is. It's quick, but it's really intimate and important. And if you blink, you miss it. See, Rin doesn't have that starting point that Hassau had. She's reaching for something that she can't grasp, not even if she had arms to grasp it with. <laughs> she doesn't know what there is to take charge of, and in many ways we're helping force her into a decision that maybe is right for her, but also maybe that she's not ready for. So Rin doesn't know who she is? Well, who is she? That's easy. And also very difficult to answer. And after playing the route several times, I'm still not 100% sure of the answer, even though I know the answer. You know? No. If what I just said was perplexing and vague and intriguing and fleeting, well, good. Then you're seeing the world the way Rin sees the world. She has a personality that tends to be off-putting, but at the same time draws you in. She is deeply scattered in distracted thoughts and worries. She's aloof and otherworldly, elusive and chimeric. She is... Jim. Oh, uh, sorry, Misha. Um, visionary, fantastical, dreamlike. There is a back and forth, and just when you think it's time to disconnect and walk away from her, something hooks you back in again. And a lot of people really like her. I think it's because she has an inner conflict, a certain uncertainty of self that we all can identify with. And because as hard as she can be to talk to, she's really easy to talk to. Easy to talk to when you have nothing to talk about. You can ask her anything and she will answer it without judgment. And at the same time, she's very difficult to talk to as her answers are often strange. Impossible to pin down. Her thought process, always unique. I don't know anything, but I know that I don't know anything. So I know something. I just don't know what it is. Rin's just weird. I mean, we know she's weird. She collects people, people with problems, not disabilities. I'll come back to this in a bit. But we're all weird. I know I am. Our weirdness is what makes us interesting. I don't remember being asked a lot ever is how genuine is her personality? Is it an act or is that just the way she is? Like I think in general, a lot of the time, readers don't consider the authenticity of fictional characters because they're fictional. So you kind of naturally assume that they are presented as they are rather than the characters would be presenting some kind of facade that is not who they maybe truly are. And to me, it seems that it would be quite possible to read Rin in that way, that she's teenage girl who kind of has decided that she is random and weird. And then that's how she acts on purpose. I think that I also did not write her on purpose that way, but I'm kind of surprised that at least I haven't seen that interpretation made elsewhere. 
One aspect of Rin's weirdness is contradiction. When we first meet Rin in private lunch, she's aloof, but she's very sharp, straightforward, very clever. In Things You Can Do, when we come across her painting her mural, and she talks about the blind boy in the art club, she's kind of detached and a bit flaky. In Foot and Mouth, the very first time we have lunch on the roof, she's quick-witted, sharp, funny, cracking jokes about Emmy's girlish figure. I started to think that maybe when she's painting, she detaches herself, which makes sense, but then, when we meet her in Mind Your Step, she is completely out of it. She has no idea why she's in town. She's not sure who we are. And she seems completely sedated more than usual. Maybe more cough medicine? Drug use would explain a lot. But I don't know. That doesn't seem like that's enough. Because she gets it together, or sobers up, when the gravity of how much work she still has to do on the mural and how much time she has left hits her. Or maybe she just has periods where she goes away. In Studies in Grayscale, the first time that we go to the art club, she's pretty detached, only slowly coming out of it. Yeah, Rin is very, very complex. And most of all, she wants Hisao to understand her. But that's hard, because she doesn't understand herself. Which is frustrating to Rin, and to Hisao, and to all of us. Rin speaks in a completely rational tone, but what comes out is often a rational insight. The world through the prism that is our Rin. What's another word for thesaurus? Which made me think of something Nomia said. Ah! Oh, huh, sorry. Nomia says that an artist is someone who takes a piece of the world and reshapes it in their image, metaphorically, through their art. They make you see the world through their eyes, which I think is a pretty cool way of describing an artist, and gives the mantle of artist to many that likely would never consider themselves to be artists. Is Rin an artist? Does she make art not because she can, but because she must? We know she makes art. We know she likes making art, at least as a vehicle to try to get people to see her, because she feels so disconnected to the world around her, lost and adrift and sometimes sinking underwater. And it's a way to try and connect. I mean, if any of us are given a chance to connect with someone in such a fundamental way, would we pass that opportunity by? I wouldn't, and I hate people. It's no different to anyone who makes music, or art, or writes something, and shares it. Or even when someone posts a meme somewhere. It's all the same thing that Rin is doing. We do it for ourselves, but when someone connects with it. For sure I think that Rin is an artist, but Rin is not sure if she's an artist. And that's the key. See, Rin's not sure of anything. And that's reflected in her art. Say, Nomi's friend with the gallery, she sees it too. That there's no theme to her work. Just a kitten playing with the things that she comes across. Which really is what Rin is doing. Mentally and metaphorically, anyway. And Rin knows this. It's why she's worried about doing the gallery. She knows the gallery's a big deal. She knows it's a great opportunity. But Rin is only ever painted to express herself. As a kitten, playing with the things she comes across. And then she's asked to paint for others. She doesn't know if she wants to do that because she doesn't know how to do that. At least how to do it and be honest about it. Because to do it and to be honest about it, she'll have to become someone. Or maybe someone different. And Rin's afraid. She's terrified of all the things that that entails. Changing into the someone that she would need to be to do this. Hanako has Lily. And maybe Akira. Shizune has Misha. Emmy knows lots of people. She's only close with a few of them. Miko, maybe the track captain, definitely the nurse. There's Rin, but she doesn't even show Rin the true Emmy. Emmy's not her Emmyist with Rin, more like a big sister. Rin doesn't have anybody that she's really, really close to. She hangs out with Emmy for help and meals, but she really doesn't know how to connect with her. And other than Emmy, who babbles at her to fill space and babies her, no one interacts with Rin, other than Nomia. Ah! Sorry. I think that's also something that sets her apart that she hasn't that kind of any kind of connection that's presented like sure she has parents but the way that i left them out from the story is meant to emphasize her lack of connections to people outside of herself you know they don't come for the exhibition opening or they are not even mentioned so who are they and since rin is such a peculiar person what kind of childhood could a person that ended up being like her have and what kind of parents would she have? Yes. And that's why when Rin decides to do the exhibition for the gallery, she says it's okay for Hasao to come visit, but not for Emmy to come visit. Why did she do that? It's because when Rin embraces the idea of change, she knows she can't change with Emmy babying her. Rin needs to do things herself. She needs to push herself. So here's this dude, Hasao, who's okay with long silences and weird conversations, and he keeps coming back to hang out and to do nothing, and that interests Rin, as she's looking for that connection. And then she realizes she really likes us, but she can't really like us, not now, because if she does, she won't be able to figure it out. She's got to leave that old Rin behind first, which is why it's so frustrating when she tells us don't come see me anymore for a while, because she doesn't tell us why. And Hasao can't figure it out because he's a moron. Yep. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm playing a Katawa Shoujo route, I naturally imagine what it would be like to have the condition of the Shoujo. To have been disfigured in a fire. To have no legs. To be deaf. Blind. 
How would it be living like that? Would I manage as well as they do? Better in some areas? Worse in others? We never find out why Rin has no arms. The obvious guess is that she was born that way, but she could have gotten sick or had an accident. An accident with head trauma would explain a lot. The steps came about because the concept art refers to her as thalidomid girl, so caused by this drug, this birth defect. And then the way that real life people are, that they have these kind of like degenerated small stubby arms right? Mm -hmm. So I think that even though in the actual story, then she doesn't have that birth defect, but we still kept the idea that she has the shoulders and small stubs of her upper arm. Whatever the reason, clearly it happened at a young age and presents very little obstacle to her. Trying to think of myself having no arms quickly shut me up, right up front, when Rin makes it very clear that she's not going to let us help with Aunt Flo. <laughs> yeah, I was right there with the Sal. Hey, I got nothing going on. I'll be happy to help you with whatever. What do you need, Rin? Oh, yeah, gotcha. Okay, uh, yeah, Emmy. Uh, yeah, Emmy, uh, I'm gonna wait. I'm right, right here while you and Emmy do that. Right here. I'm gonna wait. But that got me thinking of a couple of things. Rin doesn't like to name her paintings. Except the mural. She named that. I said Rin doesn't like to name her paintings. Because by labeling them, it makes people have a preconceived notion of what they should be thinking when they look at them. And this leads into one of the most important questions in KS. KS teaches us to see beyond the superficial, to see the person first. But Rin asked the question that's really been avoided so far. What is a disability? But Rin puts the question under the microscope. She has no arms, but she doesn't consider herself disabled. She can eat, paint, open a juice box. Not having arms isn't a disability, it's a problem when it comes to oranges. She does have limitations, but she can practice. Like all problems, there's ways around them, even if those problems sometimes require someone else to help. Hassau has arms, and legs, and sight, and hearing, and no obvious visible scarring, but he does consider himself disabled. And I found that whole aspect of this really frickin' cool, and very introspective. And yes, okay, she does call the mural no idea, but later she can't even really describe what it's about. It's a mural that's about a mural. It's the most mural it could be at its muralist. Muralist. Murali- Murialist? Really? Muralist? Fuck, that's terrible. Muralist. Cut that. Cut that line. Because it's art. And art is not something that's meant to be understood. Rather, art is something that's meant to be interpreted, seen through the lens of us. And sometimes, maybe, we find something there that we connect to, something that makes us feel. I think the, the perspectives on art that the story is presenting are things that I've picked up along the years by in generally being interested in things. And how should art be understood by people who are experiencing or, or looking at it? And then, of course, I made that a theme of the story as well, that how should other people be understood by people? So, how do we interpret Rin? She's always at her Riniest, and being with her is weird, and alluring, and uncomfortable, and comfortable. The easy silence of just being with someone, and the magic of watching her create, with talents and skills we can't even imagine for ourselves, and never knowing if she's being wonderfully dry and sarcastic with deadpan humor, or sometimes she's just really missing the obvious that's being said and happening around her. And as always, she sees things in a way that we would never have considered, all the while peppering her observations with very astute, poignant, and pointed remarks, all of it keeping us wonderfully off balance. And at some point, Rin has feelings towards Hisao. Wait, Rin likes us? <laughs> yeah, I wonder when that happened. Could it be as early as that first meeting? The moment where there's something like a tiny smile on her face, because after that moment, we never have the same kind of conversation with her again. She's always more distracted, shorter sentences, less direct, much more vague with the things she says to us. Sure, the next phase she's worried about the mural, and then there's worry about the gallery. But there's time between those two events when we really never have the same quick cutting edge Rin. Almost like she's worried that she's going to say or do something that would make us not want to be around her. So when did we become her first occasional visitor? Was it when we helped with the mural, undemanding and helpful company? Was it when we spent the day of festival just being with her? Or during the fireworks? Was it when we were on the roof and just talking about the sky and panties? Was it being with her at the track meet where she was surprised that we showed up? We said we would, and so we did. And she reveals that a lot of people had made promises to her, but they didn't keep them. Was it in the art class when we sketched each other's portraits and she admits that she thinks we're interesting? Was it constantly bumping into her in the hallways, quiet in each other's company in the middle of that chaotic school hallway? Was it when she asked us out if she could listen to his irregular heartbeat? It was her way of saying she's been thinking about us. Was it when we followed her out to Worry Tree, listening to her concerns and confusion about what she's feeling and connecting as we realized our own similar struggle? 
You know, it doesn't matter when it happened. What matters is that Rin found someone. Someone courageous enough to do absolutely nothing with another person. But someone who sat there with her, listened to her, and all of her weirdness, and he didn't leave. And on a hilltop covered in dandelions, Hasao and Rin both take a step forward in their lives, understanding themselves enough to know that change happens regardless, and that it's okay. It's normal. In Rin's route, they say you have two choices, accept things as they are, or change them. That's the key to life, making friends with you. Things you don't like, change them. Things you can't change, accept them, embrace them. This is essential before you can love, really love, anything or anyone else. And it wasn't until the end that I realized that what Rin is doing with her paintings, in many ways, is what I'm doing with these videos. Not that I'm looking at people watch them and see a much deeper Maddie D, I'm pretty sure I wear that on my sleeve, but it made me ask, why am I doing it? Like Rin, I'm trying to capture the moments of the now me, the experiences that are fresh and new when discovering these characters, these people. It's like everything I'm feeling can't be contained and it needs to come out. I kind of have to do something with the overflow. And like Rin, when I revisit them later, it's reliving that event, almost. Like opening a time capsule of feels. And cringe. And if somebody out there connects to it, well, then good. So with your feet But this video feels very different from all of my others. I mean, I talked a lot and really fast, so it's the same. And I really did cover most of the route, but I left out so much of it. I didn't talk about her breaking away from the school and Hassau when she felt suffocated. If you look at all the frustration that Hassau and we deal with throughout her route, the difficulty understanding the person, the difficulty finding the right words, the saying the wrong things, the finding comfort in the uncomfortable silence because you don't know what else to do, you realize everything Hassau goes through is a mirror of what Rin has felt her whole life. Yeah, I did reflect them of each other a lot throughout the story. That there's sort of like contrasting them and then again drawing parallels that there's something same but still not quite the same and so on. The whole thing about the blind dude that paints! About how play is a natural event that people and animals engage in and how Rin's style of play, peculiar and foreign, is most apparent when she's sick and high on cough medicine. Which made me replay that scene about five times. The whole point of that scene is to sort of show her... Uh, unfiltered? Uh, yeah, un unfiltered. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. And the rest of the time, then she has some kind of filter on or, or something's going with her. And of course, like the way that she's written is that both Hisa and the reader are supposed to be sort of left puzzled by her. Their first kiss. How Hasao actually does spend a lot of time watching girls sleep in this route. How one choice had a huge impact, but the other choices in the path, even the one I got buttered about, only really have subtle changes, or color the dialogue slightly, but not really change the story, leaving it feel more like a kinetic novel. Or the conflict of feeling overwhelmed and exploited at the gallery, which is the culmination of Say's premonition about Rin's immaturity as an artist, Nomiya's ambition, Hasao's good intention but a misguided desire to push Rin forward, and Rin's feeling confused and detached, and alien to what her entire life she's been told is normal behavior. Pushed to the point of nihilism, painting is all I can do? Which was a really freaking big event. You also haven't said anything about the Luid. I also haven't said anything about the Luid. Uh, Lude, sorry. Like that scene where Sal surprises her at the gallery and she's trying to, um... She's, uh, you know, she's, the uh, you know, with the activity and the, uh, paddling the pink canoe. Menage a moi. Finger paint. Oh, no, that doesn't work in Rin's case. Honey the muffin. Are you trying to say... Masturbate? Yes. Yes, I am. And I'm visibly blushing. What was I talking about? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, right. Okay. And when we walk in on her doing that, and I'm all like, Oh, fuck, I don't want to see her naked. I mean, she's hot and I'm a dude, and I totally want to see her naked. But what a situation. Totally not appropriate for us to be here. How is our hero getting out of this one? I couldn't look. What a great scene. Brutal. Tearing. And real. Or that one scene that sort of hints at Emmy and Rin uh, might have been doing the old shoes in a suit together. Or when she comes and visits, soaked from the rain. Now you know I'm not a big fan of visual novel lewd scenes, because they're so easy to make terrible. <laughs> because, come on. But the lewd in Rin's path is hands down... Oh, uh, the, the lewd in Rin's path is one of my favorites of all of the roots so far. The writing is a tease, the whole time making me want more, in the good way. It's subtle, suggestive, and not in any way smutty. One might even say poetic, romantic.
most of visual novels of uh, that have sex, it's horrible. It's it's awful pornography, and it's pretty gross. There are like very few that I've ever seen that handle sex scenes in any kind of tasteful way. So actually, I tried pretty hard with that gummy fish as well. We worked pretty hard on making it something that we ourselves could tolerate and would feel that the tone is correct. Uh, I don't know. It was pretty difficult I, relative to the amount of writing and uh, effort in there. I, I really did then work on those more than the same size of text in somewhere else in the story. So It made me think, wow, if I ever have to write a lewd scene, I hope it's half this good. Kudos. I'm a big fan. Glad that it somehow ended up being reasonable. But my script for this video, even finished, feels really flawed, estranged, unkept and awkward, with none of the usual structure. It's, it's jumbled and vague, with some really rough transitions. Like Rin? Hey, yeah, like Rin. And I guess like me. Maddie, at his maddiest. Where is my mind? Where is my mind? This story used up all of my patience most of the time. As crazy and infuriating as it was dealing with Rin, as much as I understood Hassau's frustration, and as much as I associated at times with his anger, I never once thought about quitting on Rin. Rin is difficult, she can be tiresome, and she's real. And maybe Rin represents the unknown nature we all have in us at times, whether it's fear, nervousness, or being pushed into a direction we don't really desire, or even not understanding things that are happening around you or to you at times, but doing the best you can to deal with them in your way, as you. The most important question asked in this story isn't answered. Following what kind of a question is one that isn't a question, a rhetorical question, Rin asks, what kind of an answer is an answer that doesn't answer anything? It's a great question, and it's not answered. Because it's not a question that's answered with words. It's like the sky. The sky is always different, it's always changing, and that's alright, because it's perfect that way. Just like you. You will always be changing. You will always be becoming something different. And you'll always be all right and perfect. At least, that's how I interpret it. Where's my mind? Where's my mind? Where is my mind? <laughs> Muriel. <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> what the shit? That does sound about right for a Rin video.